All right, chemistry kids, here's another tutorial video for you. This video is for the covalent compounds part two homework assignment, which covers the topics of sigma and pi bonds, uh, coordinate covalent bonds, and hybridization. So we're gonna go through each of these topics separately, and I'm gonna go through the homework and do the at least the first part of each of these sections in the homework. So we're gonna start with question 1A. And this question is about sigma and pi bonds. It says, draw Lewis structures for the following compounds and label all pi and sigma bonds. So from the notes, you should have this table. In your notes, we talked about sigma and pi bonds. And it's actually a pretty simple concept. All you really need to know is that when you have a single bond, that is formed by one sigma bond. A sigma bond is always the first type of bond to be made, so you can see each single, double, and triple bond always start with a sigma bond. But once you have a sigma bond, um, there's no more space to have more electrons um, on, on the end-to-end -end overlap. A sigma bond is an end-to-end -end overlap of the orbitals. So once you formed that, uh, you have to form pi bonds after the sigma bond. So the single bond is a sigma bond. Um, when you have a double bond, like I said, you start with the sigma, but then in order to make another bond to form a double bond, you have to use a pi bond. And then for a triple bond, you start again with a sigma, but then to get the other two bonds, those are both made by pi bonds. Um, you can check the notes for some diagrams on what the overlap of those orbitals looks like. But for this video, to answer the question, really you need to just have this table and the understanding of what makes up these different types of bonds. So because of that, we're going to need Lewis structures to see whether we have single, double, or triple bonds. So you'll always start with Lewis structures, and if you go through your steps, some of you are pretty comfortable at this point with Lewis structures. Um, so I'm going to go pretty quickly, and some of you might not even be adding up electrons just because this one does follow the honk rule, so you could use that. But I'm just going to add up my electrons here. Carbon has four valence electrons. Uh, each hydrogen gives me one, and then oxygen gives me six for a total of 12 electrons here. I'm gonna pick carbon as my central atom for many reasons. I know it likes to have four bonds and it shouldn't have dots. So I'll put the carbon in the center and then I will attach everything else to that. I have two hydrogens and an oxygen. And since the honk rule um, says that carbon likes to have four bonds and I know I'm not allowed to put dots on carbon, I know that this is gonna be a double bond. Okay, and that also makes oxygen follow the honk rule as well because it likes to have two bonds. So I'll finish up the electrons there to give me a total of two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 electrons. So this is a good Lewis structure. Once you have your Lewis structure to figure out um, the sigma and pi bonds, you just use this table. So we're gonna go through each of the bonds and label it as sigma and or pi. So each single bond here is going to be a, a sigma bond because according to our table, that's one sigma. So the symbol for sigma is like that. Okay, so those are both sigma bonds because they're single bonds. And then for that double bond on top, notice a double bond is made up of one sigma and one pi bond. So the way you can label it, um, I'm gonna label one side sigma and one side pi to represent that that double bond is made up of one sigma and one pi. And now it doesn't say to do this, but if you want, uh, you could write the totals down here. So you have three sigma, and one pi for that one, okay? So you're gonna do the same thing for B and C. Remember, you need the Lewis structure first. So that's sigma and pi, pretty easy topic. But you do need Lewis structures. We'll move on to number two, which is talking about coordinate covalent bonds. Also a topic from the notes, it says to use Lewis structures and arrows to show the formation of a coordinate covalent bond between ammonia and a hydrogen ion. And then I added this hint to form NH4+. So in the notes, we talked about coordinate covalent bonds and we did this example on the board. Remember, a coordinate covalent bond just means that one atom is supplying both of the electrons to form the bond. So in the example we did in class, um, the nitrogen in ammonia had a pair of electrons here that it could use to attach and make a bond to boron here. It's okay for boron to only have three bonds here because it's an exception. But then when we make that new bond here, the electrons in that bond, both of them came from nitrogen and that makes it a coordinate covalent bond. So we'll be able to draw a process like this using curved arrows to show the formation of a coordinate covalent bond on the homework, starting with ammonia and we actually did the Lewis structure for ammonia already. So I'm gonna draw um, the Lewis structure for NH3. It does follow the honk rule here. 
okay? And we have that Lewis structure already. And then for the hydrogen ion, you're just gonna write H plus, okay? So you can see the atom that's gonna provide both of the electrons to form the bond is nitrogen because it has a lone pair here. So those two electrons can be used to create a new bond. So you're gonna use a curved arrow and point to the hydrogen, saying that now those electrons are gonna be used to make a new bond. So you're gonna draw an arrow and then show that new bond by drawing the Lewis structure for NH4. So now, instead of having three hydrogens around it, nitrogen also has gained another bond to this new hydrogen. So I'll draw that up here. And since it has a charge, we do need to put that in brackets and put the charge there. So just to be clear though, if you are unsure, this is the coordinate covalent bond. That was the new bond that was formed by using nitrogen's lone pair of electrons. Okay, so very similar to the example done in class. All right, last topic for the video is hybridization, um, which will be in questions three and four. I'm just gonna do part A for both of these, but I'm gonna run through the notes for hybridization. So it'll be pretty clear how to do the rest of them, I think, from that. Um, so hybridization, as we covered in class, it's when you mix the S and P orbitals to form new hybrid orbitals. And we're, we learned about three in class, and so it's the S combining with either one, two, or three of the P orbitals. They merge together and form new hybrid orbitals, and we'll look specifically at three examples of how that works. Starting with carbon is the example used to show how we could have four bonds um, and create these hybrid orbitals called SP3 hybrid orbitals. So the way it works, is we look at carbon's orbital diagram. Um, this is review from unit one, so if you're not sure how to do that, you can watch the video on electron configurations and orbital diagrams. So we have um, two electrons in the S orbital and then two electrons in the P orbital. So what we do to explain how carbon can form four bonds is one of the electrons in the S orbital is actually gonna move over to the empty P orbital here. And by doing that, you will get four half-filled orbitals. And not only that, the orbitals actually merge. So the S and the P orbitals mix together and you create a hybrid orbital. And the name of the new hybrid orbital is called sp3. So this is an sp3, 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 sp3. And the name comes from how it was formed. So you can think about to form these sp3 hybrid orbitals, you used one S orbital and you used three P orbitals to form it. So that's why it's called sp3. So you can almost think of it like s1 p3. It's telling you how they were made. So that results in four identical orbitals that are equal in energy, and you can form four bonds with these half-filled orbitals. Okay, the other example we saw was for boron. In order to explain how boron forms three bonds, according to its electron configuration or its orbital diagram, it looks like it would only form one bond right here with this half-filled orbital. But what we see happen is the same thing we saw with carbon's orbital diagram. One of the S electrons is gonna move over to the P, one of the empty P orbitals. Those now three orbitals will hybridize to form sp2 hybrid orbitals. So this time they're called sp2 because you used an S orbital and two p orbitals, as you can see here, to form it. So that's why it's sp2 this time. You still have a leftover p orbital that is unhybridized. And this shows how boron can make one, two, three bonds. For example, in P or BCl3. Okay, and the last example we talked about uh, was beryllium. Beryllium is uh, an exception to the octet rule that we haven't talked about a lot but I'm telling you now, it only makes two bonds. And the way we can explain that, if we look at its orbital diagram, is one of its S electrons will move to an empty P orbital. You will hybridize those S and P orbitals to form this new hybrid called SP. Remember, we often leave out the ones in chemistry, so you can think of it as S1P1, which is how you end up with two orbitals, but we just call them SP orbitals and you can see how beryllium could form two bonds from these half-filled orbitals. In this one, again, you have leftover p orbitals, but this time you have two leftover that remain unhybridized. 
and we talked about the shapes of these in class, you can check the notes for different diagrams of, of this hybridization. Okay. So to use this information to answer our questions, um, hopefully you'll see how easy it is if you have your notes. So the first question says, show how each of the following elements form hybridized orbitals, label the orbitals both before and after hybridization takes place. So I'm gonna do part A. So for beryllium, really all you need to show is directly from the notes. You're using orbital diagrams to show how you form these hybrid orbitals. So what I wanna do is I wanna show the orbitals before and after hybridization, specifically for beryllium for part A. So beryllium's orbital diagram before, I had an S electron, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna show, I'm not gonna show the different energy levels and that's fine, but I have one orbital for S, and the P sublevel has three orbitals, so I'm gonna draw that, and beryllium just has two valence electrons. Notice on the notes it says 2s and 2p. You don't have to have those two numbers. It just says what energy level it's in, but the s and p is the most important thing. So notice here beryllium is in group 2a, which means it has two valence electrons. So I need to put the two valence electrons here, according to the Aufbau principle. But then I'm going to show how these will hybridize. So what ends up happening, in order for beryllium to have two bonds, is one of these electrons will move to one of the empty p orbitals. So I'm going to show that with an arrow, and then on the other side, I'm going to show what that looks like once they become hybridized. You'll have two new hybrid orbitals. Each of them will be half-filled. So that electron moves over. Now you're going to have two half-filled and the name of these hybrid orbitals, there's only two of them, and to make them, I used an s orbital, and I used a p orbital, just one, so the name of these is sp. These are the sp hybrid orbitals. You would also be left over with uh, two p orbitals that were unhybridized. You can choose to draw those, or you can leave them out. This is really all you need. Okay, so I think you'll be able to figure out boron and carbon from the notes after looking at that answer. And then question four says to draw the Lewis structures for the following compounds and then label the hybridized bonding as either sp, sp2, or sp3. Um, and again, we see the same three elements that we've been talking about. But just so you're aware, um, you can think of in terms of bonds, if it is sp hybridized, it'll have two bonds. If it's sp2 hybridized, it'll have three bonds. And if it's sp3 hybridized, it'll have four bonds. And you can see that in the notes that we just went through, sp3 hybridization could have four bonds. sp2 hybridization could have three bonds. And then sp hybridization could have two bonds. So when you draw the Lewis structure, we'll go through part A really quickly here. Based on the number of bonds it has, we can figure out what type of hybridization is in that structure. So for CCL4, um, I will run through this pretty quickly for the Lewis structure. Carbon's going to be my central atom, and then there's four chlorines that will be attached. And this will follow the Honk rule. Chlorines are halogens, so they like to make one bond. Carbon likes to make four bonds. So this is our Lewis structure for CCL4. So according to this Lewis structure, carbon has four bonds. And so that tells me that it is sp3 hybridized, because that would explain how it could make four bonds if it underwent sp3 hybridization. So based on that, you'll draw the Lewis structure for part B and part C, and based on how many bonds it has, uh, you can identify the hybridization, okay? So we just went through one question from each section of the homework. Hopefully with that tutorial video along with your notes, you'll be able to finish the rest.